Mijn gast vandaag was een geradicaliseerde Palestijn, een moslim. Een snuipschutter, een jongen die een dodelijke haat had tegenover de joden. Hij wordt in 1951 geboren in Gazastad. Al snel verhuist zijn familie naar Saoedi-Arabië. Zijn vader doet zaken met de vader van de meest beruchte terrorist ter wereld, Osama Bin Laden. Op 16-jarige leeftijd sluit hij zich tegen de wil van zijn ouders aan bij de terreurbeweging El Fatah van de PLO. Haat is een drijfveer en hij wordt de chauffeur en handlanger van Yasser Arafat, die hij enorm bewondert. Later besluit hij om te gaan studeren in Amerika. Als bijbaan gaat hij aan de slag in de horeca en heeft daar een bijzondere ontmoeting met een van zijn klanten. Deze man vertelt hem hoe je vrede kunt ervaren. Op een unieke manier spreekt God dan tot hem dat hij de weg, de waarheid en het leven is. Deze ontdekking verandert zijn leven en zijn haat voor de joden. Hij richt in Jericho een organisatie op om tot verzoening te komen tussen Arabieren en Joden. Zijn motto is, vergeving is de sleutel tot vrede. Mijn gast bij thuis vandaag is Tassir Abu Sada, oftewel Tessada. Habibi, hey, my friend Habibi. Tassada. How are welcome, you? Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for yeah. inviting me. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Masalam. Ah, yeah. Ah, Tass, it's not only a, a great honor to have you here at my home in this program, it's called Home, but it's also, you're also the first person who has murdered people. I've never had somebody here that was a murderer. Ah, yes. Uh, I'm ashamed to say yes, I was. <laughs> um, but I'm so grateful for the grace of God that have found me. Yeah, and brought me peace to love those I hated so passionately. And now, working towards peace and to bring peace to our people, the Palestinian people and the Jewish people. This is my calling after salvation. <laughs> Isn't it probably the best calling you can have because we live in a world that is really hoping and trying and doing all the efforts to bring peace between the Palestinians and the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. You know, for centuries, uh, the world leaders have always tried to bring peace, and they failed. And, you know, as I become a Christian and began to study the Bible and, and the Word of God, and I kept thinking, why are they failing? Good leaders. Yeah, if I may interrupt you, because Tony Blair tried, Mr. Trump recently, uh, and many, many others, and, and Voice and, of America, yeah. uh, the Europe, and I believe because they never looked at this conflict as a spiritual conflict, they always looked at it as a political conflict. But isn't it a political conflict? Not really. No? No. It is a 4,200 year old conflict that began because man did not wait on God to give him the child that he promised, Abraham and Sarah. They, you know, Sarah took it up into her own hand to have a child for her husband. And so she encouraged Hagar to go and sleep with Abraham, or encouraged Abraham to go sleep with Hagar to have a child through her. And that's the beginning of the conflict. That's why I say it's a spiritual. Although Abraham knew the God of Abraham, and so did Ishmael too. But tell me about Ishmael and Abraham, because that is vital in the story. Yes. Oh, yes, it is. It is the root of this conflict. You know, Abraham had uh, Ishmael was born and and the firstborn of Abraham's. And after Abraham, after Ishmael has been 13 years old, God appeared and said, you know, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son through Sarah and, and making it short. 
And so, so Ishmael, Isaac was born, and then at the age of three years old, Isaac, three years old, Abraham, as, as a cultural, Chaldean cultural, they gave a party for their three-year-old son. And in that time, Ishmael is about 17 years old. And Ishmael was looking and showing jealousy. The Bible says, mocking Isaac. Ishmael was mocking Isaac. And Sarah saw that. So she went to Abraham and she said to Abraham, Abraham, the son of the slave woman will not be sharing in the inheritance of my son Isaac. He and his mother has to go. Hagar. Abraham was troubled. His firstborn son. He raised him as a mighty hunter. But God appeared into the picture and God said to Abraham, it's okay, Abraham, do as Sarah said. I will look after the boy. And so Abraham the next morning woke up and he made a loaf of bread and gave it to Hagar and put on her shoulder with uh, a skin of water. A skin of water is about four gallons or four liters. And so they sent him into the desert. Here I am, a son of Ishmael, and I'm reading that. And I was crying. I was angry. I throw the Bible across the room. I said, I will never worship this God. This is not just. And I didn't want to have anything to do with it. Because you are a son of Ishmael. I'm a son of Ishmael. Not many Christians understand that. Eh? No, no, they don't. That's why the conflict is so raging. And so, but after I calmed down, God continued to talk to me and realized that that is my calling to bring this healing because the sons of Ishmael have talked, Ishmael have talked to his sons about this, that he was kicked out of his father's house. Yeah. Didn't even give them a donkey to ride at that time. They walked across the desert. And so they held that grudge. And since then, it's been between us and the Jews, the conflict. That's why I'm saying it's a spiritual, it's not a political. Born to 4,200 years ago. 4,200 years ago. And is still raging because all the leaders want to bring a political solution. It's never going to. No way. Until the church wake up and church begin to take their responsibility. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemaker in Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. When I read that first time in the Bible, I was shaking. I said, Lord, I want to be a peacemaker. I want to be your child. And that began my calling to bring peace between Arabs and Jews. And since then, that's what I'm doing. Today is the first day of Christmas. So, uh, and, uh, you know, Jesus was born not too far away from where you live. About that's right. Uh, Bethlehem and Jericho are almost neighbors. So w what would you say, uh, uh, what does Christmas mean to you? You know, uh, Christmas in the years before I become a Christian really didn't mean much to me. <clears throat> when I become a Christian, suddenly I'm understanding the family issue and the family relationship that Jesus had for us, especially in Christmas. And for me, that is a a special day and going to the West Bank and then going to Bethlehem and visiting the first time the the uh, nativity scene where he was where he was born I can tell you I was on my knees crying like a baby I felt that presence I felt that presence it meant a lot to me to understand also the family life that Christ wanted for us to have. And so, yeah, Christmas Day has been very special to me from the day I came to know Him as my Lord and Savior. Before that, didn't really mean much to me. Let's start when you were born. We talked about uh, Isaac and Ishmael, but you were born in the Gaza Strip. That's right. My family originally from the city of Jaffa. My family left their home in 1948, right before the war, to escape the war. 
And of course, the Arabs lost the war, so my family was stuck in Gaza, and that's where I was born in 1951. But two months after my birth, my family immigrated to Saudi Arabia. So I grew up in Saudi Arabia. How was that life? Huh? How was that life? It was a terrible life. Although my father did very well and did a very successful business, and in parts of it was in partnership with Muhammad bin Laden, Osama bin Laden's father in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, they were in partners and uh, did very well. But yet, as Palestinian immigrants and refugees, we always told we were Palestinian immigrants, refugees. You sold your land to the Jews and you came to our country to take our country. They reminded us every day of our life. And so growing up with that kind of atmosphere that built a lot of anger in my heart and hatred, not towards those Saudis that were calling me an immigrant and refugee, but towards the Jews who I believed caused me to be an immigrant and refugee. Yeah. So, at but, the, but if I may interrupt you, you were a Muslim, your father was a committed Muslim, you lived in Saudi Arabia, a Muslim country, so it was also not only Jews against Palestinians, but Muslims against Muslims. Oh, yeah, it's true. That is true. I was a Muslim. My yeah. family was Muslim, and, and my family still are Muslims. I'm the only one in the family that is a Christian or converted to yeah. Christianity. But they were treating us like a garbage, like a garbage. So how was it to grow up as a young man with dreams and hopes and ideals? I didn't have any hopes. No? I as long as Nothing? I am in that refugees. My father did very well. He became yeah. a millionaire. He was very wealthy, and even in Qatar, even become more wealthy. But yet the fact that we were Palestinians, still an obstacle. We are immigrants and refugees. We are homeless, basically. Still till today. Until today, and still fighting for it. Yeah. I mean, not me, but Palestinians. And so at the age of almost 16 and a half, I decided that's it. After we lost the 67 war, I thought, this is not true. These Arabs are selling us out. We are going to fight for our land. So I went to my dad. I asked him to give me permission to go. He didn't want me to. So I ran away from home. I joined the Yasser Arafat forces. And you called me a killer earlier. Uh, it is a painful reminder. It really is a painful reminder to me because at the time I didn't believe I was a killer. I was a freedom fighter. I fought for my homeland. I didn't go to fight because of Islamic ideology. At the time, I didn't have any Islamic ideology. I was a Muslim, yes. But my goal was to have a home back. And that's what I fought for. And eventually, as Yasser Arafat saw I was a leader, type of a leader, he started promoting me. I became a captain of units and then become an assassin. I was trained by North Vietnamese to be an assassin. When becoming an assassin, that's when it began to be very painful to me. Because as an assassin, I study the life of the victim more. I get to know them more than they know themselves before I finish them up. We're talking about Jews. Talking about Jews, Christian Arabs too, and some Muslim leaders that stood against, against Fatah Arafat, yeah. or Yasser Arafat. So it wasn't just Jews, but the majority were Jews. And so that began to be painful. And that's when I... Did you consider yourself a killing machine? As angry as I was, yes. As mad as I was and as anxious as a, I was to be, to become, to have a home. Yes, I was. I, um, I say that with sadness, not yeah, with pride or joy. If I may, you know, I think in images, but I see you there with a rifle uh, as a sharpshooter, pointing at somebody's life. And could you kill without remorse, without any feeling? It was. It was remorseful for me, especially after I studied the life of the first victim. Yeah. And, and I was hesitant to, to pull the trigger, but behind me was a North Vietnamese with the gun. If I don't do it, he'll shoot me. Oh yeah, that was the way. 
And so I had to, but it took me three weeks to get over that. Yeah. They had to re, really reprogram me again. Yeah. You were with Yasser Arafat, you were his driver. I drove him uh, periodically on a special yeah. uh, missions. Yes. Yeah. Knew him very well. Yeah. Well, you knew who he was. We in the West had an idea that it was a great guy who wanted peace, who had a, a warm smile. I met him once with Brother Andrew. And uh, Brother Andrew always says, you better hug a terrorist than uh, shake hands because otherwise he can shoot. I like that expression. <laughs> but he gave an image of a friendly, nice guy. Yasser Arafat was one of the smartest people you'll ever meet. And you know something? Looking back and thinking back, because I went to meet with him in 2004, after I become yeah. a Christian, yeah. to witness to him, to tell him about the change in my life. Yasser Arafat, when whatever history uh, uh, described him to be, he fought, he lived and fought for a cause that he believed in, to free Palestine. So whatever we say he is. So he was genuine. He was genuine. Yeah. He fought for his family, for his f people. So he, he did was, not he need was, the money. He was he, truly your hero. He was. He really was. Uh, naturally, when I become a Christian, the picture completely changed. And, and my outlook at him, that's why I wanted him saved. Yeah. That's why I went to him, yeah. to, to witness to him. You know, it was amazing to me. He knew me very well. He reminded me of things that I've done that was yeah. really bad things. He reminded me of these things. He remembered. Yeah. His memory was sharp. I forgot all about yeah. these things. And uh, he was so genuine. He ordered dinner. And he had the dinner, the food put right in front of him. And he was eating pieces from that food and then pass it on to me with his hand. And I was surprised, what is he doing? Why is he doing that? Then I realized Poisoning. he was trying to make sure that there is no poison in that food that he would not kill me. That's the kind of leader that he is. He was willing to die first. And he did that for his people. Not ja many people. Jasser was... Arafat did not need money. He was wealthy when he started the yes, uh, Fatah organization. He had money. And Arab people, Arab leaders poured money on him. Not because he wanted money, because he wanted to free. You were for a while with Fatah, with uh, Yasser Arafat, and then? After uh, several operations uh, as an assassin, that's when I began to realize that maybe if I get more education, I can fight the Jews. It's always been about the Jews. Yeah. Fight the Jews with my brain instead of my weapons. <laughs> and I talked with the Yasser Arafat, and he looked at me and he said, young man, I would encourage you to do that. You are a born natural leader. You need to go back, find the education, and then go back, fight for your country as an educated person. So he encouraged me to go. It almost sounds like he was a father figure for you. He was. Yeah? He was, yeah. He really was. He saw something in me I didn't see in my yeah. own side. But you are a born leader. I, I am a better leader now that Jesus is my leader. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you hate the Jews so deeply? Did you ever try to understand the pain of the Jews? next to the pain of the Palestinian people. You see, no, I did not. I only saw my own people and my own pain and my people pain, being homeless, being refugees, being called immigrants or refugees and treated by the very wealthy nations like, like trash. Yeah. Uh, still today, until today. So, no, I did not at the time. But you know when. But, but can you describe to us how you thought when a Jew, when we, you would see a Jew? What would you feel? Hatred, bitterness, uh, even when she was a beautiful uh, woman. Uh, or? Yeah, I thought he was an occupier who occupied yeah. our land, our country. 
Egypt. I did not understand anything about Israel. And Israel, you know, was existing long before. Yeah. You know, Palestine did not come to existence until 2,000 years ago when, uh, when uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the Roman leader who hated the Jews so much that he named Israel Philistine. Yeah because the Jews hated the Philistines at the time. Yeah. And that where name Palestine came from yeah. for 2000 years before the Jews returned to the land. So before that, I did not understand anything about this until I started reading the Bible. Yeah. But didn't you see at that time that, uh, well, Palestine, the Palestinians were suffering, uh, were living in poor conditions. I've seen it all with my own eyes. Uh, I've been there many, many times, and Israel was prospering. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the country is uh, became wealthier and wealthier. Did you never think, why is that? At the time, no. In the 60s, no. We, uh, I never thought about the fact that God, you know, it was God's power that the, the Israel won the 67 war. At the time, I thought, these Arab leaders are crooked and they're selling us out yeah. to the Jews. That's what I thought. Yeah. But when I studied the Bible, it hit me. You know, the first experience I had when I read in Matthew 5, 43 and 44, when the Bible, the Lord saying, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. I jumped off my chair and I said, no way, I will never love them. I know what the Lord was saying to me. <laughs> He's telling me to love the Jews. Yeah. They realize at the moment I was worshiping the king of the Jews. Yeah. I didn't connect that at the time. But that's when I really was crying and, and, and saying, no way, I will never. And I went on my knees and I was crying because I love Jesus. But the Lord in his grace spoke in my, whispered in my ear, very, very softly saying, they have done more than that to me. Because I was complaining to him how yeah. the Jews took yeah. over my land and my family got, you know, all of this. I'm complaining to him. And the Lord said, they have done more than that to me, but I still love them. And that broke me. Yeah. And but I cried and I said, Lord, if you love them so much, I will love them too. That happened in America because you went to the United States. You had a choice to go to many countries, but you choose to go to the United States. At the time, I didn't know why. I hated Americans just as yeah. much as I hated the Jews. Yeah. <laughs> but why was I was so drawn to America at the time? I had no idea. But I went. Yeah. And, and how did I get a visa? That was a miracle also, that I got a visa to go there. <laughs> and I was on the wanted list by the Jordanians. <laughs> By God's grace. Exactly. Here you are in America, working in a restaurant, uh, cleaning uh, dishes, and your first client is Charlie. Yes, yes. Remember Charlie for me. Oh my goodness. An because amazing man. Amazing man that he was my first customer to take his dirty dish away, and he looked at me. I was so nervous, my hands were shaking, because I was so embarrassed. I've never done that kind of work before. And Charlie noticed that. He looked at me with such, uh, he has the same beautiful smile you have. He said, thank you, young man. And I thought, wow, this rich man is thanking his servant. That touched my heart. I made a decision, I'm gonna take care of that man, good care of that man. And I didn't realize he was a, 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 a regular customer. And then I was told he was a billionaire, not just a millionaire, a very wealthy man, billionaire. But yet he treated me very like an equal person. And for 19 years, he just loved me. Never one time told me anything about his God. Not one time. 19 years. And then? Until God's time came. <laughs> and I was looking to buy the restaurant where I started as a dishwasher. I left and I started businesses other way. Uh, other in other places and went back to buy it but I didn't want to leave it in the same location and uh, <clears throat> Charlie being a businessman he was trying to help me find the right location and then he came to me one day mid-February of 1993 I remember that 
he told me about a building I should go to look at. It was an old funeral home that I went to look at just three days before. And you know, being a Muslim, we are taught that any place that had dead people have demons and ghosts in it. So I went to this building and I ran out of there. So I said to Charlie, I said, Charlie, I was there just three days ago and man, when I walked in there, I felt demons and ghosts in the place, I ran out of there. He laughed at me for the first time he brings up the subject of God. He said, Tass, do you know why you feel scared like that? I said, no, why? Said, because you don't have the fear of God in you. Charlie, I'm a Muslim, I fear God. He said, no, you don't. But he said, not to worry, I can help you, I can fix it. Points his finger to the sky and says, I have connection. <laughs> I laughed at him and I walked away. But you know something, Brother Jan, we never know when God is using words we speaking and change the life of a human being forever. Charlie thanked me 19 years earlier for taking his dirty dish away and that captured my heart. Now he's capturing my mind with this word connection. For three weeks after that, I'm thinking, what is this connection? I keep calling me and say, oh, you're not quite ready yet. <laughs> Till I got to the point where I could not eat, I could not sleep. And finally he came to tell me about his connection. We got to the house and he's opening the door. He was talking to me about miracles in his life and this, and he opening the door and he said, Tas, to have the peace that I have, you must love a Jew. I froze. Literally. He knew how much I hated yeah. Jews. He knew everything about me. But I thank God that Charlie loved me enough that he was willing to tell me the truth. He calmed me down and said, come on, let's sit down. So we went inside. I said, what is this connection? He said, what do you know about Jesus? I know Jesus. I believe in him. He's a prophet. Isa. Yeah, Isa. He's a prophet. He said, well, he's more than a prophet. I said, what is he? He said, he's the son of God, he's God. I jumped off that so I said, Charlie, that is a blasphemy. I don't believe in this. I don't know what's wrong with you, man. I'm getting out of here. Explain why Muslims see Jesus or Isa as a prophet and not as a son of God. Why that's impossible? Because the Islamic teaching. They don't believe that he was, he was born, he was born of a virgin. Yes, they would believe that as Muslims but we don't believe in him as a God and a son of God. He's a prophet. He was raised as a prophet to bring the gospel to the world or to the, to the uh, Jews, basically. So for you, what Charlie said was an insult. Jesus is the oh, son of God. A huge insult because that's a blasphemy. Yeah. And he, he yelled at me and he said, calm down, come back, sit down, give me just a minute. And I love him so much. So I went back, sat down. He went and he came back with a box. And he had a Bible inside of that box. He took the Bible out, brand new one. Took it out of the box and he set it between the two of us. And the Bible was close to my thigh. I jumped away from it. He said, why did you jump like that? I said, I can't touch that. He said, why? It's just a piece of paper. I said, no, and he was flipping the pages. So no, no, it's got the word of God and the name of God in it. He says, so you believe this is the word of God? I said, yes. <laughs> Why did I say yes when we as Muslims really don't believe that? <laughs> but in that moment, I believe the Holy Spirit took over. Yeah. He said, okay, if you believe this is the word of God, let me read to you what it says about Jesus. I said, go ahead. He picked up the Bible, brand new, no marking in it or anything. He opens, he looks at that and he started smiling. And he started reading. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God in the beginning. I started shaking, and I lost conscience. The next I know, I'm on my knees on the floor with my hands lifted up, inviting Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I heard myself. I'm looking at Charlie, and he's sitting in the sofa, and he's shaking and crying, and I was worried about him. Charlie, what's the matter? Are you okay? I said, man, I've never seen anything like this in my life. You looked weird, but I like it anyway. And he comes and he hugs me. He said, when I started reading the word to you, you started shaking violently, and then you were taken off the sofa in the air. Then you looked like you were fighting something. Then you were brought down to your knees. And then your hands were lifted up, and he said, you started speaking in a language. He said, I didn't know what you were saying. It was not English. 
was speaking to a light that was saying to me, I am Jesus, a powerful light, saying, I am Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there is no other way to the Father except through me. And I instantly believed. The power of that love that was coming over me through that light was so powerful. I never could doubt that. Why did God have Charlie open to the book of John? Why John? John 1.1. 1, 1. As a Muslim, we are taught that Jesus was the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Muslims believe that. And it's in the Quran and it's in the Hadith, the sayings of Muhammad. Yeah. And so when, Je when Charlie was reading to me, in the beginning was the Word. That's not what I heard. What I was hearing in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God in the beginning. In the beginning, the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the earth. And so the Quran says Jesus is the Word of God and the Spirit of God, just connected. And suddenly, I'm on my knees inviting Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. That is started the turnaround in my life. My family, my, my son, after the day after I was saved, I woke up in the morning and I felt the same power I felt in Charlie's room, in my bedroom. I felt on my knees, I, I fell down on my, in my face and began to worship a God I did not even know. And then I heard myself praying a prayer. Oh God, bless your people Israel. Oh God, gather them back to the promised land. I heard myself saying, and it literally I took my hand, shut my mouth, what am I saying? I jumped off the floor and I ran out of the bedroom. And then my son was in the bathroom shaving. I stopped and I looked at him, he was 18 years old. He looked, I looked at him and I said, son, I wanna share something with you. He said, what dad? I said, yesterday I gave my heart to Jesus. I think I've become a Christian. My son's eyes got so big, he had face shaving cream on his face and he came running, he's crying and I'm crying and then he started saying, oh dad, I'm so happy for you. Stop to think, why is the boy happy for me? He said, son, why are you happy for me? He said, dad, three months ago I gave my heart to Jesus too. I'm a follower of Jesus too. And I was just crying. Lord, you are so amazing. You saved my boy. My son told me that he and his church began praying for me for three months. They are praying, prayer chain, 24 hours a day, praying for my soul. Till three months later, God drawed me to, because of my son. That's amazing. God is an amazing God. He is. Yeah, I, because, I just tear every time I remember that. Yeah. Because if son, my son told me that at that moment, when he got saved, I would have killed him. Just as my family was trying to kill me for 11 years. They, my son was so wise, he kept it to himself and just prayed. And the followers of Jesus prayed till they made my life so miserable, I couldn't look but up. And God so blessed that child, that son. He's my daughter, my wife's son. He's not even my son, but yeah. I adopted him when he was five weeks old when I met my wife. Yeah. I fell in love with him instantly, and I didn't know why. But you didn't fall in love with your wife. You just married no. Karen to get permission to my live My green here. card. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. But that boy, I just fell in love with him. Yeah. And I, you know, three years later, I was going to divorce Kiran, but I couldn't. Yeah. So I went and adopted yeah. Ben. Ben Ali is my yeah. son yeah. now. I adopted him and gave him my name. Yeah. Ben Ali Taisir Abu Sada. Yeah. I didn't know why. As a Muslim, this is a big no-no yeah. to adopt somebody else's son. Yeah. It's a huge no-no. But I just fell in love with that boy, and he's such a wise kid. He's a pastor of worship at his church now, a beautiful big church in Kansas. How did your life go on? Because you went back to the Middle East. Yeah. 
after I studied, I was studying the Bible and, and scriptures and other books to understand and wait for my God to call me. For 15 years, I was studying. Finally, the Lord called us to Gaza as the first calling. I went to Gaza for the first time in my life. I lived there, I was two months old, never been there. So in 2004, uh, 2005, the Israelis allowed me to go to see where my birthplace. So I went to the spot where my family tent was as, as a refugee camp. And I'm standing there and I'm crying and then the Lord spoke into my ear saying, it's time for you to return to your roots. It shook me. I looked up to heaven and I said, God, why Gaza? Why not Hawaii or a place like that? Who wants to go to Gaza? I really didn't want to. But God insisted and he won. And we went to Gaza and we began the work there. And then Hamas, when they took over, they realized that I was uh, a converted Muslim. So they, they destroyed everything. We started there and we went to Jericho. Yeah. So we've been there in 10, 10 years now. And God really blessed that work. Blessed that work abundantly. And we are so grateful that God is calling us to serve him and, and leading more Muslims to the Lord. That's the calling. I mean, there is nothing else. You know, it's not the projects. It's not the projects are tools to bring more, to bring peace. Because that's how we're going to win is when Arabs and Jews have their peace. And so our calling is not just to build projects and stuff. Our calling is to bring peace, to build a bridge of peace between Arabs and Jews. And you do. And when I heard first about you, I couldn't believe that it was possible, uh, especially with your background, I thought. Yeah. And when I met you, I didn't need long, a few seconds, I thought, yeah, this is for real. And uh, so I'm deeply impressed with you know, that biblical area where you work, the Mount of Temptation is oh. close. The tell of Jericho where, you know, they walked around seven times and then Jericho fall. So, and where yeah. Zacchaeus the found Kies Jesus. Zacchaeus house, yeah. Yes. Zacchaeus tree. Yeah. The, uh, the and here is Seeds of Hope. Mm -hmm. I shopped in your store. Really? And I oh, love yeah. your olive oil. I love your za'atar. Ah, oh, za'atar. Uh, by times I only come in my kitchen. Oh. And then I smell. Oh, of course. Yeah. I love it. Oh. <laughs> it's heaven. Yeah, it is. It's really heaven. It's heaven. To dip oil in the, and then dip it in the za'atar. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can live on that forever. <laughs> Seriously, and the dates. And the dates. The dates, these yeah. dates are uh, Jericho dates. Yeah. And, and we buy them from a uh, Coptic church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, an Egyptian Coptic church who, who have uh, date trees. And so we buy everything yeah. they produce in order to support yeah. them and help them. But what I love is what is labeled. It says seeds of hope with a heart in the middle. Yes. Because that's what you are planting there. Yes, seeds exactly. of hope. You know where that name from? When Jesus was speaking to me in a form of a light, there was two hands in the air next to that light. And it had the cross tattooed right there. <laughs> when I saw those hands, I knew whose hands were those. When I was 17 years old in Saudi Arabia, I had a nanny from the Philippines. Her name was Miriam. She had exactly the same cross. The Lord was reminding me of that. I sent you an angel to plant a seed of hope in your heart. When she was sent away, when you were 10 years old, she continued to pray for you. The Lord was reminding me of that. That's why we named it Seeds of Hope. The work we do is to plant a seed of hope in the heart of the Palestinians and the Jews. So Both. that someday our volunteers who comes to help us from all over the world, they are the <laughs> angels that prays for every child in our schools, whether it's in Israel and Jerusalem or in Jericho. Our volunteers pray for them to plant that seed of hope. 
Can you honestly say that you love Jews as much as your Palestinian I brothers do. and sisters? You do? Wholeheartedly. I love Israel. I love the Jews. I, I become, I realize, I understood that this land is really belongs to Israel. I understood that is. And that's where the freedom in my heart came. When I realized that this is the land of Israel, the land of the Jews. God gave it to them. But God also is a merciful God. He did not just give it to the Jews. Yes, this land is Israel land for both sides to live peacefully. That's why I don't believe in the two-state solution. I am not for the two-state solution. I believe in one state for both to live equally. See, when you look in the Bible, and we read in, let's say, Ezekiel 47, for example. Ezekiel 47 is a chapter where the Lord redivided the land among the tribes of Israel. And then if we look at the 21st verse, at the end of that chapter 47, God says to the prophet Ezekiel, that land to give the foreigners or the aliens, in different translation, the foreigners living among you to give them an equal share of the land or to treat them as equal Israelites. God knew this conflict is going to be raging and God knew that the Jews are going to be returning to that land and God knows that there are going to be Palestinians there to live. You know, Herzl, when he wrote uh, about Zionism, yeah. He encouraged the Jews when you go to the land to treat the people living in that land equally. Although he was not really a believer, or even a Jew, oh. a Jewish believer, he was a Jew. Yeah. But he understood Zionism always taught to treat the foreigners living in that land equally and to give them equal share of the land. So. That's where I have a little problem sometimes with Israel when, when they confiscate lands that actually have its own. The Palestinians have a title that they inherited from their ancestors, like my own family. They had title to that land. My ancestors were growers, orange growers and fishermen in Jaffa. And they were part of the tribe of Dan. They were part of yeah. the tribe of Dan. And they were given their inheritance yeah. according to the tribe of Dan. Dan, the tribe of Dan, owned all the seashores yeah. of Israel. And so that's what we know. Some of our ancestors, whose original name is Ben Sada, they are Jews today. They are existing yeah. in Tel Aviv. Yeah. I met them. And when I met you the first time, I thought, I will meet Tassada, and he will be surrounded by four bodyguards and drive in a car <laughs> <laughs> that is bomb-proof. Not at all. You walk around there and like, how come? Yeah. Are there angels around you? I'm not uh, a secret believer in Israel either. I'm, no. I'm just like how we are now. Um, I believe that the Lord you know, I wrote this new book, yeah. The Mind of Terror. In that mind of terror, I'm telling people, especially the Christians, what causes the mind of terror, really. And I'm listing six uh, uh, points. One of them is the fact that I, I just wanted a homeland. Yeah. Okay? And so many of others wanted a homeland. And some did not like what what Christianity is showing. They think everything they see on television is Christianity. And so those extremists, you know, when we talk about extremism, there is extremism in Islam, there is extremism in Christianity, there is extremism in, in, in Judaism too, yeah. and Jews and, and Israel. So extremism is not just Muslims. The Islam is God is taking it so farther and it become going back to the 14th century Islam when they started taking over other countries and doing in extreme way 
to, in order to capture the land. And so they're bringing back the 14th century ideology of building Islam again. I'm not d condoning the ISIS and, and people like that, and I'm talking about that in my book. No, that's what I almost found surprising, that you are kind of mild, yeah. because you understand. Because I, I, I have been given uh, a privilege to be safe, to know the truth. Grace of God came into my life and gave me an eye to see. Now, you ask me, why don't I have so many bodyguards? So many people have suggested that and willing to pay for it, to have bodyguards around me. The Lord said, go forth for I'm with you, fear none. And I believe that. You don't fear? I don't fear. When you go to sleep at night, you're not fearful not that. All. No? Knowing that God is with me, who can be against me? <laughs> Thus, the message of your book, uh, The Geest of Terror, just published the by Mind Gideon. Of terror. The Mind of Terror. I said the Mind of that. Terror is written what? to the Christians, <laughs> yes. really, to help the church. How can they reach out? In, in Holland, you have so many uh, refugees and immigrants that are coming to your country. How can the church reach out to them in love? just as I reach out to them in love. This book is for the Christians to understand how can we change the mind of terror to a mind of peace. If you look at the back cover of the book, this is the mind of terror, the face covered yeah. face. Yeah. And that's the cover, the mind of peace. And this is how we can reach out. God is gifting you with, with thousands of Muslims that are coming to your country. And I know many of them are coming and giving their heart to Jesus because they saw the darkness of Islam in their country. When you stand before Jesus, will he say to you, Tosh, well done, you great and faithful servant? I'll be melting. <laughs> I'll be melting. I reserve... I you know, having my own experience in cooking, and then I, I, I said to the Lord, Lord, can I be a cook for your, for your feast? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, we were talking about Yasser Arafat. Don't be surprised when you go to heaven and you see Yasser Arafat there. Don't be surprised. You leave it up to the Lord. <laughs> we'll leave it up to the Lord, of course. Brother Andrew, led him to the Lord, another friend of mine yeah. who was a powerful pastor who led him to the Lord too. And I said to this friend who told me, I laughed and I said, you don't know Yasser Arafat. He said, no, I know Yasser Arafat. He was trembling and shaking and with tears as he accepted, prayed the sinner prayer. So we never know. Five no. months later, he was died. Nothing more powerful in the name of Jesus. In conclusion, what would you like to share from your heart with the family, seven viewers? My family, my father, praised me in a way that what I am today. Of course, he did not know Jesus at the time, but he, he raised me in love. He was tough, but he knew how to raise me. And so I want to pray for my family, my, my own family, my, my wife and my son, my daughter, my grandchildren, and my daughter-in-law, they are all saved and serving the Lord. I just want to see that hope in my, my brothers and my sisters. Why don't you pray for that so, with us? I want to ask the church to be praying for my family to come to know Jesus. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this privilege that you've given me to be in this show with, with my friends and my brother and my. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity you've given me to glorify you in all that we do. And Lord, I want to lift up my family to you. This show is all about families. And I'm so grateful, grateful that I have this privilege to speak to the audience, the church, to ask you to pray 
for my family to come to know you. This is my only hope that I have now is to see my family coming to know Jesus too. And Lord, I want to lift up all the Muslims to you around this world and especially in this country, Holland. So many of those Muslims have come. Did they have come just to have a better life? Yes, it is true. They wanted to have a better life. Just like any human being, they want to have a better life for their families. But also, they have come so that the followers of Jesus can touch them and show them the true way for peace. Peace in their heart first, and then peace for others. So I, I, I want to pray for the people of Holland not, not to be um, giving up. I know my people are not easy people. But please don't give up to them, on them. Reach out to them. They will come to know you. So many have come to know you, to, to know the Lord. So many. Because of the darkness of Islam that have covered this world. So many have seen the darkness and they want to see the truth and the light. You are the only answer for that, my friends. So reach out to them. In Jesus' name, amen. I say amen to that. Amen. amen. Thank you, Tas. Thank you for sharing a message of hope. We could have talked about all the terror attacks that uh, we face in Europe and other countries. Uh, but, you know, the seeds of hope that you gave in this program will be remembered. And thank you for being Praise his servant. Praise Every guest Lord. here will write down on this home oh. uh, his, the one word that identifies her or his life. Mm. So what is the key word in your life? Mm. You don't have to think, I think. A key word. Yes, your One key word. word. One word. Trust. Ha, beautiful. Vertrouwen, zeggen wij. Hmm? Vertrouwen, in Dutch. In Dutch? Yes. Trouwens. Yeah. It is trust. Trust, yes. Thank you, my friend, Brother Jan. Thank you for I having me. Everybody yes, will so visit you in Jericho. I hope so too. Yes. I look forward to yes. see many more Dutch coming. Wat een bijzonder verhaal van Tassada, van een brute killer, een apostel van de vrede. Ik hoop dat dit verhaal u heeft aangesproken. Het kan bijna niet anders. En we vinden het fijn om uw reactie te krijgen op dit programma. Mail ons naar thuis at family7.nl Wij als team vinden het leuk om thuis te maken. Ik werk als vrijwilliger mee, zoals zoveel, om de programma's van Family7 mogelijk te maken. En mijn vraag aan u, steun Family7. Hartelijk dank.